Hello guys and welcome to another MSC Performance Podcast with me, Mark Olson and Luke Rogers. Hey guys. Hey, how are we doing? Good, oh, mate. I'm good. It's good to be back. It's nice to be back. Nice to be back, yeah, with a couple of weeks uh, and we leave. Two, is it? Two weeks. Two weeks. Shocking. Shocking. Um, had a lovely time. Had a lovely time. Feel refreshed, energised and ready to go. Great week to come you, back you for. You chose a hell of a week. Yeah, well, you chose two great weeks to go on holiday and you chose a great week to come back for as well. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Literally, the day we were driving down was like absolutely pouring down the rain, yeah. like 11 degrees, disgusting. And then the day after that, it was just unbelievable for two weeks, basically. Uh, and then come back and it's raining. Yeah. And it's obviously a big week in the, in the gym as well with loads of stuff uh, going on. So... Good to be so back. Called the so-called hype week. Uh, yeah. Performance testing in uh, Barber Club, and then we've got the Metcon Games as well, which is like a, a strongman-based and performance-based uh, conditioning session. So lots of heavy track bar, lots of log press. Um, it's going to be a good day. And yeah, testing through the week at the Barber Club as well after 16 weeks that we've been back open since uh, lockdown. So it's a chance for people to kind of see how they progress, see where they're at, and then get ready for the, the next training cycle. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. So we're going to talk a little bit more um, in terms of how to how to prepare um, in this podcast. Talking about how to prepare for um, testing, how to prepare for competitions, perhaps whether that's um, you know uh, powerlifting, you know, competition quarterly, uh, or if that's weekly, you know, you're a field athlete and you compete in weekly. We're going to talk a little bit today about how to you know make sure that your performance is you know not only good on the in the gym but where it most counts you know on the on the day of actual uh, actual performing um so we'll talk a little bit about that we'll also link it into what we'll be doing with the barbell club and how we're going to sort of try and uh, try and peak the guys for uh, for saturday as well but in terms of the the hype week as uh, we you know we've referred to it as this week with the barbell club like you say guys have come through a full 16 week cycle uh well the guys who sort of joined uh, straight after lockdown um others have had a little bit less time but still you know doing a little bit of testing and seeing where we're at and so far so good it's been awesome um you know with uh you know monday night and obviously this morning on tuesday morning you know, testing out the, you know, we've got the two different groups and we've been uh, testing out the, the squat and the bench and uh, there's been some awesome results. Are there any, any that have stood out for you particularly, like, or, or just overall, are you, are you really impressed with how the guys have done? Well, what I really like, I really like it because it is quite, like, you take a beginning group of people and you get them to do some strength training, they're going to get stronger. So what really impresses me is when you take people that are already strong, that have already got a good strength base, and you let them progress on a little bit easier. Because it would be so easy to take a novice, complete beginner, never done any strength training, and get to get them stronger. But well, we've got people that are doing like really, really good things in, yeah. in strength training. Yeah. You know, they're not competitive pilots, but the people that work full-time jobs, that's, you know, and they enjoy doing a bit of training. And the barbell club's three times a week. But yeah. you've got like, you know, Mel, who's you know, she's deadlifted 220, she wants to do 227 on, on Thursday, which is a ridiculous trap bar deadlift for a, a woman that's under 70 kilos. It's it's ridiculous, yeah, it's very um, high level, yeah. It's like we're not talking like beginner yeah. level there, that's and high level. She squatted 130 as well, which it just it's not out of place at like a decent yeah, yeah. level powerlifting competition. And like I said, she trains three times a week, she also does the met concessions a lot, yeah, 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 she, yeah. She does everything, she's great. And then, like, you look at, like, last night, Alex, uh, Alexander squatted uh, 190. Yeah. High bar, like, yeah. legit. That's a very, very good squat. Uh, it's an over double body weight squat. And he's someone that's got a vast experience of training. And he's he's got an all-time PB after 16 weeks of being at, at the barbell club. So, yeah. so those are the great ones. And then on the other side of it, you've got people that haven't done anything. So it's a little bit easy to make the case. But just the enjoyment and the satisfaction that they get from making it. I've yeah. seen Lance Sil today this morning. I'm like, super happy about squatting. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's done a little bit of strength training in, in the past, but this is the most structured she's ever been. And she's getting great results. And just how happy people are looking from doing it is, is cool. So I guess the two ends of the spectrum is, is really cool to see. 100. percent Yeah, I think you make a really good point there with like the more advanced guys. I think it's easy to sort of think of it as like you know for beginners, but we do train them. You know, in the barbell club, like it. You know, it is suited for intermediate and advanced lifters as well. Um, you know, and especially with the the individualization we can give online as well, with the you know the uh, the regular regular coaching and feedback and check ins and load monitoring and things like that, you can you can be a really high level. Like I say with with someone like Mel, that's you know a very like you know pre this sixteen week block, yeah. she's at a very very high level. Alex is at a very very high level, and there's others too. And then like to still be putting on 10, 15, 20 kilos on deadlifts and squats. 
in 16 weeks is, is good um and that's and that's brilliant um you know and not not to be overlooked and then like say with you know you've got you've got beginners you've got more you know people have done a little bit you know someone like Naomi this morning you know I think her previous like one RM on back squat was was 80 and she got 100 today and it was still quite comfortable um and with her like she you know she might have had a bit more than 80 before potentially but like just to give her the confidence of going sure. a bit heavier is quite a big thing as well knowing that like she, she was just like you know oh, I've never really pushed it I've never, you know I've always squatted that you know, I've never really pushed it and she's done like a unbelievable techers like you know good quality squat and 100 kilo and it, if we're being honest it wasn't quite one rep max testing like there's probably a bit more in the in the tank but you know it's a good and that's it's a, it's that's a, good a big start. for her she's still 20 kilos up still really good technique she'll come away from that super happy so yeah exactly yeah and a 55 bench i think 50 bench something that's something good. along those lines so again you know narrow narrow grip as well yeah. like you know real narrow grip on the press um you know uh trying you know be a little bit more sort of rugby specific for her but you know it's you know fantastic and it's great yeah. great to see and just seeing the confidence of the guys and that's why i think the testing like is 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 great really you know obviously we're giving them a you know a big sort of cycle to build up towards it you know we're not going in cold far from it um but it really gives guys the the confidence to be like jesus i'm gonna lift you know it's really opening their minds as to what they're capable of and what the potential is and then they hit those sort of numbers and obviously next week we start the new cycle where it's obviously going to be a big back off in terms of intensity uh, or re you know, relatively relative back off in intensity and chance to work the skill skills a little bit more, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of a sudden they're like, well, okay, I've hit you know 100 for one. I could be start you know I could start my first week with 80 kilo, 85 kilos, and that might have been a previous you sure. know max or something like that. So it gives them the confidence of Jesus, I've had that amount of weight on my back. All of a sudden I can you know I, you know I realise I've got a lot more potential to to work with. So. It's been a mega week so far, and I'm really looking forward to deadlifts tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night and Thursday morning. It's going to be, uh, you know, it's getting, deadlifts are always good fun yeah, think, yeah. with a with one RM test. I think on that thing as well, a couple of the things that we've heard from people that have never kind of done proper structured strength training is like they would almost be doing some sort of testing almost every week, so like working yeah. up to a heavy single heavy. So from actually accumulating a good amount of quality work for 15 weeks has led to this testing. Um, so actually like working towards something rather than testing and the difference between training towards this specific goal versus testing every single week is massive. And I yeah, think that's kind of what we're going to talk about with the peaking is like how we're working towards a certain date and the idea is to have your max performance on this date. And so far no one's missed that date. Um, there are chases where obviously you get the, the peak is slightly longer and people's max performance is a week or two out earlier. But I think that the way that we structure things has worked really well, that it's gave them a chance to accumulate work. They haven't been chasing numbers, which is an important thing. And now everyone's hitting PBs so far um, when they needed to, when it comes to testing. So Absolutely. It's a wonderful example of like, you know, your top end 1RM stuff being a good demonstration of strength. But in terms of building strength, it's actually a lot of work at some maximum percentages, developing the skill, Develop, you know, developing, you know, the technique of how to brace, how to move properly, improving movement quality, and just building a reasonable enough amount of volume at, you know, slightly sub-maximal, you know, percentages and loads to actually build that strength so that on the day you can demonstrate that, like I say, you get a lot of people who, you know, yeah, they, they're working up to singles on the regular and, you know, and this is, uh, you know, great, you know, great sort of, uh, you know, proof in the pudding that it's, you know, it's not about that. It's about building. Yeah. You know, building throughout. You know, the, the the cycle, however long that is. And obviously, we we work in sixteen weeks, which is you know, which suits really well. It could, it could be twelve weeks, it could be you know, twenty potentially, but sixteen generally works really well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's great to see. Great to see. So, um, do you want to yeah, actually talk the guys through the uh, how we how we've kind of peaked for this week and yeah. the structure, as they sort of talked about. We've got a sixteen week. Yeah, but I think if we break it down into macro, macro meso, and then the, the, the final week, which I guess is not the most important week, the work's either done or it's not, but that's yeah. kind of a make or break. But yeah, looking at the cycle as a whole, like we're starting off with like a, lots of focus on accumulation, so lots of high repetition work, lots of some maximal volume, a good chance to, to get a lot of repetition work and get some good practice in and really try and develop um, the skills of the list that we're going to be later on testing. So that would look like lots of sets of around, let's say, as high as like on the competition it's like eight reps down to maybe five or six yeah. accumulating a good amount of some maximal work working on force and intent 
Um, and within that kind of first four to eight week block, just gradually increasing the intensity, working towards some kind of testing metric. We're testing in a different way. So instead of doing a single as heavy as you can, if you like, a heavy is five around eight RPE maybe, so two reps in reserve. And we use that yeah. kind of as a chance to gauge the where success of the training block, gauge where we're at for the next training block. But that first eight weeks is heavily based around improving your work capacity, improving your rep quality, uh, like I said, accumulating a good amount of work. Then then final eight weeks, the kind of switch happens where we stop focusing on accumulating a high amount of work and we focus more on that top in intensity. <clears throat> we spoke a lot in the, in the podcast about it not being a one or the other. It's always a, you know, a certain amount of dosage of intensity, but then a focus on volume. Yeah. So even when we're doing the high volume work, we have that little bit of intensity, maybe like one or two sets. Um, yeah. But then it kind of switches after the eight week mark where we then start to focus on the high intensity first. And then we're using the working sets just to accumulate volume and, and keep a good amount of work quality in there so that we're not detraining and not doing enough work to, to maintain the qualities that help us get stronger in the long term. So the last eight weeks, massively focused on intensity. Again, not working up to, to true maxes every week, but you know, anywhere between like singles all the way up to sets of five, but the key being between that kind of six to eight RPE mark. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times we can do singles all the way, but we're just making sure that we're saving the actual focus of the session on, on the higher intensity work. So hundred percent. Like <clears throat> I think an important thing to note is like, you, okay, you've got, you, you've got structure there in terms of, you know, just for our listeners there, if you want to split it down, right, you've got eight weeks of like, you know, volume and skill, volume accumulation and skill development in the first eight weeks, second eight weeks intensity. But as you say, it's not all in with one and all in with the other It's you know, as, as we always like to train, it's getting everything done all the time, but there's a focus, you know, on one aspect and it's a shift in focus as we progress towards the, the testing. So like you say, in that first week, um, sorry, in that first uh, two blocks, so in the first eight weeks, you know, we're not saying, right, you're going to be doing three sets of eight, four sets of eight, that sort of stuff. In week four, week five, it might be, you know, you're doing one, you know, working up to one set of four, uh, seven RPE or 7.5 RPE, and then you're doing your back off sets after that to get the best of both worlds. So you're getting, you're building up and getting one or two good sets at higher intensities, still in week four, five, six, seven, that, those sort of weeks. And then we're doing our back off sets yeah. to, you know, to accumulate, accumulate the volume. And then when you get into that second cycle, if you like that, you know, we block three, block floor, uh, four. So between weeks eight and 16, you know, that's where you're spending a little bit more time on the intensity work, yeah. you know, you're getting a good amount, you know, you might be doing, you know, you know, fives, fours, threes, you might be doing two sets, three sets of those, but then you still, you know, we still yeah. like to have the back off sets in one or two back off sets. Uh, you know, and a decent amount of accessory still, so that we're still getting you know enough uh, enough volume in. So to avoid that situation as well is um, if you do just you know volume for the first eight weeks and then just intensity for last, the jump is ridiculous, man. So you eight go up to like let's say you got a set of eight to eighty percent, and then you want to do a triple at eight seven percent or even slightly more. That jump is massive, and just, then just your preparedness for intensity is so low. Yeah. Rather than having this little dosage, then. You know, the jump from doing a triple at 84% to jumping to 87 is very, very manageable. And you're not like so unprepared for it. All of a sudden, like mentally, if not even physically, you're starting to like screw yourself over. Yeah, it's keeping it's keeping yourself in the, you know, in, in the game, keeping the CNS like used to used to heavier loads. Um, you know, just the feel and the feel of the weight as well. And just, you know, I say it's like even if um let's say you're an Ollie lifter and you're doing like a massive like skill block. You know, you you know, and you you're not too fussed about strength. You'd still keep some in there to keep that that stimulus. You know, you'd uh, still maybe do, you know, some work up to a, a daily whatever. You know, daily double, triple, single, whatever. You know, even if it's at eighty percent or eighty five percent, and just to keep some, you know, skin in the game. I think I say skin in the skin game. In the game is that is that? Right? I've never heard so, that before, Mark. But I'm sure game. it is uh... skin in the game. Okay. Yeah, so the last Take yeah it. the last four weeks are uh, the priorities on your high intensity work, and if you're doing whatever you're testing, it doesn't have to be one at max, but your testing um, should look a little bit like well, your so your performance in the gym should look a little bit like what you're going to be testing. If you're testing, you know, two rep maxes or, or let's say one rep max in this example, and you're doing sets of eight, in terms of specificity, it's not really what you're training towards. So those last four weeks should start to look a little bit more not all of your training, but start, should start to look a little bit more like what you are going to test. Um, and then I guess the key week is, is that, that final week where you're trying to reduce the fatigue down while still trying to maintain the strength and the skill. Yeah. And I think the mistakes people make with this is either taking a week off or just having a week completely off like heavy work. 
Yeah. And I think along with the research then anecdotally what we seem to think what works best is a small drop in intensity. So maybe like five to ten percent drop in intensity, uh, but a drop in volume by anywhere from like the first couple of sessions, 30%, yeah. then the last sessions, maybe even like seventy percent drop in volume. Yeah. So you might be doing on session one, let's say you're doing five hard sets, the last couple of blocks or the last block, you might drop that down to like two or three sets. So it's a a 50% drop, then that last session, you're dropping that volume right down. The yeah. key is you're trying to maintain that intensity because the intensity seems to be very heavily linked towards the performance. Um, if we keep the volume high, we drop the intensity, we lose our preparedness and readiness for that heavy work. Uh, but if we maintain the intensity and drop the volume back, in particular dropping back on the accessories and the working sets, what happens is we maintain the fitness, but we drop the fatigue and the, the fatigue fitness paradigm that everyone talks about. That's what we're looking to, to maximize the, the fitness and sometimes the fatigue masks that you'll find sometimes you're in the gym, middle of a block and the fatigue is so high that you're not able to, to perform um, maximally, which you don't have to be doing all rounds. But the idea yeah. is that when we get to actual testing, we want that fatigue to be as low as we can and that performance to be as high as possible. So we drop the volume back to reduce the fatigue. We keep that little bit of a dose of intensity to, to maintain the strength and maintain the performance as best as we can. Um, and then come the day, hopefully we're, we're in the best shape possible to, to lift to the optimal results. 100%. Yeah, I think, yeah, in a, in a nutshell, that's it, isn't it? It's a, you know, it's a drop in volume and a main, main te- you know, maintaining intensity or close to maintaining intensity. Uh, but generally speaking, it's the volume and, you know, especially if you're working at high percentages and times, you know, the, the volume against the intensity, it's the volume that's going to, you know, fatigue you, um, especially if you're working at high loads. So it's minimizing the actual total amount of work you're doing. Yeah and um you know but maintaining a stimulus of heavy load um you know keeping the cns you know firing keeping us used to heavy load not dropping off too too early so you know like you say if they have a week off before and then coming back and trying to try and lift heavy i mean it's you know it's it's it's, it's really really tough to do so so i think an example a good example is like these last two weeks in the bar when it's pretty much in line with most kind of kind of step tape protocols is the two weeks out they're pushing the intensity um in terms of like the back off work and their uh, their accessible very much in maintenance yeah so instead of pushing like high rps and pushing high repetitions we've encouraged them to reduce the reps by maybe two or three repetitions but keep the weight the same so they maintain the intensity they've dropped the rpe they've dropped the volume down um so that's going to help them facilitate that recovery uh, but still pushing hard on the uh, on the comp lifts. then this final week that we're coming into it uh We've got your testing and then the last couple of uh, the last session before we do a, a speed session in particular for the guys doing the, the metcon games uh we're doing our speed and power based session where the volume is literally like 10 percent of what you would normally do but we're still trying to do some kind of speed and power movements just to kind of prime the cns yeah. and there's some good research behind doing a speed and power day uh prior to a competition so that's why we get people in the day before two days before to be doing some kind of like low intensity maybe like 50 60 percent of their maxes for speed work yeah and um, or even like jumps and throws and i guess this links us then into kind of what you would do as part of your rugby prep where things are a little bit different you're not prepping every three months you've got a game every single week pretty much so your kind of peaking for that week is going to look very different to someone that's got 16 weeks and trying to get it right on one day yeah 100 percent. i mean just you know in terms of that uh do, you know coming in doing like 56 percent the day before it's you know it's, it's great to just you know you know both psychologically and you know and, and physiologically as well to groove those movement patterns really just get that bar on the back get a feel for it go through the commands if you can be in a power lifting yeah. in your head perhaps um you know and uh just, and just groove it and then you know physiologically in, in terms of you know firing up the central nerve and nervous system you know recruiting high threshold mobile units the day before you know it's you know there's good research behind doing it and then yeah absolutely in terms of um you know in terms of field sports it's obviously a little bit different as you say because you you know you're competing weekly in season so you might have a game every every saturday for example so what you'd look at doing in season is you just put that into you know just put that into a micro uh micro cycle in terms of the, you know week by week you'd look at perhaps let's say you've got a game on a saturday you might be doing a uh you might have a day off or an active recovery on a sunday and then you'd basically if you're training let's say um three you know mo- most um semi-pro and amateur amateur clubs um and, and, and full-time professional would probably do you know three gym sessions a week yeah. um you know semi-pro amateur clubs would probably do two 
uh, sessions in the rugby club um, a week and then the game on Saturday. Um, you know, top class pros will be, you know, doing a bit more on that during the week in the club. But generally speaking, three gym sessions a week. So you'd go in probably on a Monday and do like a, you know, a, you know, a moderate, moderate type session. So that might be like some pretty heavy upper body stuff. Uh, it might be lower body unilateral work um, or like, you know, some maximal percent, percent type stuff. Tuesday, you'd go in and do a high day. So you do a really hard day. Um, most clubs would train on a Tuesday night. So what you do ideally is on a Tuesday morning, you come in and you do your heavy lifting. Um, you know, still wouldn't be a massive amount of volume in season, but be, you know, you, you might be your big deadlifts or your big squats, and, you know, big, you know, big bit of, you know, pull up work, press work, things like that. Um, you know, you know, potentially super sales, you know, power stuff. Um, Tuesday night train. Wednesday, you know, you potentially have off usually, I'd yeah. recommend. Um, and then a Thursday or Friday, you would look at that. Uh, session really similar to powerlifting, you know, the day or two before the comp, where you'd come in and you work at fifty percent, sixty percent, you know, potentially even lower, um, you know, if you're playing weekly. Um, so you like you'd come in on a on a Thursday or Friday. I, you know, I like both. I like it's good research by training the day before, which I really like. Um, personally, I normally do it on a Thursday instead, so I do like a Thursday AM, and then I have my rugby training at the club Thursday night. So it's kind of a double day. So it's still mm. kind of like we class it as a high day. And then Friday, I'd have off and then compete Saturday. Um, but either way, whether it's a Thursday or Friday, a lot of that comes down to preference. But that would be your lighter, you know, lighter uh, session, especially in terms of volume. Yeah. So the volume will be a real low. You can still keep a decent amount of intensity, um, but your volume would be quite low. So like you can absolutely do a heavy bench on a Thursday or Friday, no problem. Um, you'd be looking at like, you know, just real low volume. You'd be looking at some, you know, some med ball work, some throws, you know, some high pulls, hang power cleans, things like that. Minimal time under tension, low volume, but high intent. You know, even if the even if the percentages aren't 80, 85 percent plus and they're a little bit lower, 50, 70 percent, it'd be like maximum intent. Intense. What you're doing. Intense and the, is the key. And the lock yeah. and the lack of volume would, you know, keep you fresh. Yeah. For the for the Saturday. You're not going to get fatigued from doing four sets of two of the ball floor or no, the exactly. sprints. But what it can do, like you said, is in terms of like the physical benefits, it can help you feel prepared for the game. And the central nervous system is feeling fired up, you're feeling amped for the game. But also like the other one is if, if you spend just Friday like at work all day, sat at a desk. You don't do anything on the night. You come into Saturday, you feel disgusting. So it gives you a chance 100%. to come to the gym, do some warm up drills, do some mobility work, do whatever you like to do to prep, uh, and then actually do a session. And you'll feel like not fatigued doing it, and it's also got you yeah. up and moving about. So yeah. uh, that's what I like doing it for power. Sorry, to, to, no, no, to, to no. do with powerlifters yeah. as well. Is especially if you've driven to a competition, um, or you're going to be driving and you've been at work to drive down or whatever. If you go into like a, a speed session, it gets you to do like your, whatever your farm mode, and gets you to some mobility work, gets you to your prep. Then you do three sets of two squats at fifty percent. It's not going to fatigue you for the day after because you're used to doing way more the day yeah. before you do heavy squats anyway. Um, it's going to leave you feeling so good comparatively to just sitting at a desk or driving down all day. So it's win. Make it's, it's win win. I think like the you know I've, I've done Thursdays and Fridays. For me personally, for, again a Thursday I think works quite well because a Friday I'm. You know, I'm on my feet quite a bit anyway. Like I'm on my yeah. feet, coaching, working, putting you know, putting weights away, like moving stuff anyway. So for me, it's like probably just a slight preference through the Thursday, just to, just you know, Friday's a busy, busy, yeah, busy work day. I'm feet, on my feet. Know, I'm on my feet a lot, but absolutely for guys who are like, you know, sat down on Friday and on Saturday you might have a long away game. You might have three or four hours on a coach and you get there an hour and a half before the game and you've got to warm up and go. Like sometimes for those guys doing a doing, doing a Friday session, even Saturday morning session yeah, potentially, yeah, yeah. Um, and just doing it, you know, doing a little bit just to get yourself fired up, and okay. um, is a, a good way to do it. But yeah, it's really, you know, it's interesting. Like you've got two different, you know, two different sports and things there, um, or types of sport, you know, powerlifting or weightlifting, and then you know, field sports where you know you play weekly against playing, you know, um, competing quarterly or whatever it might be, or less frequent. Um, but a lot of the general rules still oh, yeah. apply. You'd be going like, you know, with a barbell club, like say that last block is like starting to, you know, lower the volume and, you know, keeping the intensity up. Whereas like a field sport, you're playing weekly and it's like, you know, let's say you might, you might do that, you know, higher volume work earlier in the week. And then like you're all, you know, pretty much tapering off weekly before competition, yeah. doing that every single, every single week. So, but the, the general rule of thumb, like is the same. 
intensity no. keeping high, volume reducing as we get closer towards COP. And I like that over them, like the, the similarities, like you said, the, the similarities there and specificity is the key to that. So like that final session, I'm doing squat bench and deadlift at 50%, or maybe a little bit more on the bench press, where you're probably going to be doing maybe some squats, but I imagine more throwing movements, yeah. uh, jumping movements, more kind of movements that would maybe close and mimic what you're doing in rugby. So the idea is still there to lift with intent, to lift explosively and kind of get your nervous system primed for a high performance day of the day after. But specificity is really what we're doing there. Yeah, big time. Yeah, so, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So there you go. Maintain your intensity, drop your volume, have a speed session the day before, and uh, we're in. Focus on what you're trying to focus on. So yeah. when you do your volume work, you're trying to push your accessories, your variants hard, and you're looking to maintain the competition lifts if you're doing a competition, or maintain that top end strength. When you get into your strength orientated block and you're peaking, you're trying to prioritize your intensity. So your volume work is on maintenance, and then that last week as we step back on the volume. We put your we put your uh, accessory work and put your volume work like really low focus. Really try and prioritize dropping down that fatigue. Really trying to prioritize the performance of, of the comp lifts or whatever you're going to be testing. Then that final week, maintain the intensity, drop the volume down, have a speed session to prime your performance the day after, and then lift incredibly well. Boom. Say no more. Say no. Well, we are more. going to say more because we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about uh, fat loss and a couple of things that have come up this week uh, in regards to fat loss. If we have time, yeah, talk us through the research. You've read some, you know, bit of research which backs up backs up our kind of yeah. um, systems and beliefs and what we've kind of always done, really. So I cannot remember the guy's name from the study. It was twenty one twenty one study, and it was looking at adding. In, it was on obese people as well. So it was on overweight people who used low activity. Um, they didn't track anything else in regards to their. They did track their nutrition and they tracked their um, performance in the gym, which was like low level aerobic work. They didn't track any else activity. But what the study was indicating was that. The amount of calories that you burn in the session was an indicative of your overall outcome. So yeah. what the study was finding is that people were doing like an hour of cardio burning, let's say, 500 calories for the sake of this conversation. But that 500 calories wasn't shown in the weight loss. And it was actually only between 30 to 50 percent, if I remember correctly, of how many calories they actually burned. And the reason is, is because they're doing this activity and then they're compensating elsewhere by reducing their overall activity for the day. So it seemed that adding in all this extra cardio wasn't as beneficial for fat loss as it seems. And I thought it was really interesting because we did a podcast a couple of weeks ago talking about how one of the massive things that we take when we're looking at personal training clients or general populations that want to get fitter and healthier is looking at this kind of global approach where we're looking at their nutrition, we're looking at their performance in the gym, which we don't train to try and burn calories. We train to for what people enjoy doing and we like a performance metric because we think it helps people enjoy the training and, and be able to quantify their results. Um, but then we also look at their activity outside the gym and a lot of people would try and give them a step count or at least make them think about what they're doing outside of the gym. So just making better decisions of not driving if they can avoid driving to the local shop or parking slightly further away. Just trying to get people to keep their activity up high while they're adding in training if their overall goal is, is fat loss. But even for health, we spoke about it being a, a good thing as well. So it seems that if you are training for fat loss, that you can't just do the training in the gym, control your calories. Uh, you need to make sure that you're keeping your activity up outside of the uh, of the gym. And I thought it was cool because that's like a, a thing that we've, we've, we've talked about several times on the podcast. Yeah, um, yeah, 100%. I mean, like, you know, to, for, you know, for the listeners, like, you know, we're, you know, it's a, it's a simple equation of like, if we're looking, you know, if we're looking, looking to lose weight, you know, we need to be expending more calories than we're consuming. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a rule that is what it is. Like that's never going to change. That's basically the, law the dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, that's the basics, but like, yeah, absolutely. What, well, you know, it's not necessarily as black and white as like, you know, right, just eat less food. Um, you know, because then what can happen, like you say, is like, okay, we're, you know, let's say we get someone coming in on 2,000 calories a day. You know, we ask them to track for a few weeks, it's 2,000 calories a day, and we say, right, 1,500 calories a day, you know, which is a pretty big drop off, but just an example, you know, 50, 1,500 calories a day, why right, would well, I live on that? You know, that's, that's not necessarily going to um, equate to weight loss if the activity levels drop alongside that as well. So I think it's something to be like just wary of for people. It's not just like you know crash dieting. Hit you know we always obviously um, even you know if we even if we're lowering someone's calories, we're always you know looking at 10-15% drop off you know on average. Um, 
but like just not like crash dieting, dropping down, you know, a lot, and then you you know realize you're not losing weight, and it may well be because your energy levels are, you know, have, have shot, yeah, and therefore you're not expending as many calories throughout the throughout the week as as you possibly can. So it is possible to eat more and lose weight. Now, <laughs> someone will probably take that what I've just said and put it over yeah. the internet and say that I'm talking absolute shit. But what we're saying is that, you know, we could potentially increase those calories from 1800 to 2000 or 2200 so that we're, you know, giving, giving that person, that person's got more energy throughout the day to go and perform more activity to burn, you know, more calories and utilize more calories throughout the whole week. Yeah. They've got a healthier, um, you know, diet where they're getting more nutrition, you know, with that guys who are not eating any fruit. You know, and it's like, no, you know, not, not you know, veg. And it's like, you know, we can increase that amount and increase the calories, give the person more energy to, to, to go and be more active and to, to expend. So it's not like, you know, yes, it is, you know, uh, weight loss is, you know, it's, it's calorie expenditure versus, cal- cal- you know, calorie income. But it's, you know, like I said, it's not as black and white in terms of, right, we're going to put everyone on less calories. There's two ways to create a deficit. You can either increase the calorie, increase your expenditure, or you can decrease your calorie input. And my preference is to always try and increase activity because, yeah. especially if you've got a performance metric goal, you want to try and increase your calories to try and sustain and try to, you know, promote the performance that you're trying to get out of the gym. And doing that and doing for an extra couple of thousand steps is going to be so much beneficial and optimal to your training versus dropping yeah. the calories by 300 and not walking. Yeah. Um, so from a health perspective and then from a fatness perspective, it seems to be more beneficial to try and increase your expenditure and keep the calories as high yeah. as you can. And I did a post a while back on a, the high flux dieting, which is trying to keep your calories um, kind of the same. And then like as your weight loss plateaus, you increase the expenditure a little bit more. So like I was eating, let's say 3000 calories and aiming for 10,000 steps. And then when it got to a point where I wasn't losing any weight, I would then keep the calories the same and increase my steps to 12,000. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously it takes a little bit of effort it takes it but you know just by making better decisions by it's a nice way to live eh like mate I'd much rather do, I mean from someone that trains exclusively for, for performance in the gym I would much rather do that than keep the steps at 6,000 and have to eat 2,500 calories because yeah. all of a sudden then my my pre and post nutrition is not going to be as good so my recovery from my sessions isn't going to be as good I'm not going to feel that as, as fuel for the sessions yeah. and also I feel hungry like, yeah. I don't feel like I'm expending anything if I go for like the slowest walk ever but it's just still activity and it's still steps and it still means that I'm able to feel my body exactly how I want to yeah I remember like back in the in one of the lockdowns in the summer where like yeah I was talking to you about it like you know I was probably a bit fatter than I wanted to be and I was like right okay like what am I eating what am I doing and it was like it was actually a conversation with you that I was like Fuck, I'm actually eating. I'm actually eating all right. I track for a few days after that again, and so I was like, right, okay, I'm actually only having like, you know, it's about three, you know, three six, you know, a day, which you know, for someone Some you know my, right my size and activity level is not that bad. So it was just a case, you know, it was it was a case of like just upping my activity levels yeah. a little bit. This was like that, wasn't it? Where we were yeah. just walking as much. Exactly. So it was just a it was just a reminder of like, right, let's get moving again a little bit more, and then like I literally didn't didn't change my diet at all. Um, you know, just picked up man. So because because you know, I'm used to playing, you know, rugby three times a week and walking around the gym, you know, non-stop, walking around yeah. the gym nonstop and all, you know, I mean doing, you know, fifteen thousand steps a day without, you know, even yeah. even trying and all of a sudden it was like, you know, seven o'clock at night, you've done two thousand yeah. steps and yeah, you're thinking yeah, yeah. shit, okay. So it was like it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the nutritional thing or it could it could have been a nutritional thing. I could have I could have lowered that, but you know, fuck that. I'd you know, rather keep that where it is. And get myself moving a little bit more because you know I just don't, you know don't want to feel don't want to feel hungry. I want to be fueled enough to exactly. get out and move the and drop, be an athlete. The dropping calories is the thing that seems to leave people to them feeling hungry versus going for a walk for 15, 20 minutes at a leisurely pace doesn't seem to make people feel hungry. So that like the satiety during a session is massive, and if you're coming to training hungry, your performance is going to be so much lower. So for someone like you, so again, performance orientated, keeping your calories high, increasing your, your expenditure around the gym is massive. And then you look further at people like reverse dieting, and you see the success that reverse dieting has, which is trying to stay the same weight while increasing your calories. And this is good for people that have been on super low calories. They obviously don't want to gain much body fat, but they're looking to increase their uh, yeah, the amount of food that they can eat. All of a sudden, you increase their calories, the weight stays the same, or potentially sometimes they even lose weight, because instead of just sitting on a sofa all day because they're exhausted, 
they just start walking around more. And if you've increased the calories by 200, they might be walking around for 300 calories worth. So actually, you've increased the calories, but you've still lost or maintained weight because their overall activity for the day has increased, which means, again, the, the, the law of thermodynamics is the calories have gone up, but your exponential has gone up. So the weight exactly. stays the same. Exactly. Yeah. So what, we, what we're saying is, like, calorie deficit is absolutely 100%, you know, the, you know, the only thing essentially that matters when it comes to, to losing weight like there's no the number other, one rule. there's no there's number one rule there's no other way of you know of doing it but what we're saying is to you know to create that, that calorie deficit doesn't necessarily have to be a, a reduction in calories a redu you know a, a big drop off in your nutrition or a big diet it can be like you say eating the same amount of calories like eating your 2000 calories a day or whatever increasing your activity levels to above that you know and then therefore you know and it can be a, you know and therefore we create the deficit we create the deficit because i think there's a lot of mess you know the, the big you know chat over the last couple of years and rightly so is you know calorie deficit for for, for losing 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 body fat but you know it's I, I do think the message is like just making people focus purely on you know the, the, on the on the food aspect and yes obviously like the food plays you know Play, plays a role it's not 50 50 or 72 you know it's 100 or 100 percent like they're both really important but it's like not you know it doesn't necessarily have to be like bang i've got to bring my calories down you know why not increase the activity levels become a better athlete become stronger more healthier. robust healthier, healthier well. and you know for yeah for, for for me that's a that's a nicer way to to, to to live really and like you know even if you're not necessarily into gym you know not everybody's into gym but like just eating enough to be able to you know go out for walks for to be active to yeah. play with your kids to have the energy to you know to do these you know to, to do these kind of things you know and i did an i did an article for msc i'll link it on the uh, in this in the um podcast about like the health benefits of actually getting the walk and going to the gym itself it isn't enough if you're spending the rest of the day sedentary so you need to actually get these steps in as well so from a fatness perspective the expenditure is the key then from a health perspective if you're looking to improve like cardiovascular health and your your overall quality of life you need to be doing more than two thousand steps in a gym session yeah your steps needs to be 100 percent. like yeah like I mean, an example of a client of mine is and this this is you know really 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 common is like you know start started off with me you know he's by his own admission overweight you know not in the shape that he wants to be or used to be you know he's got kids etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know obviously you know nutrition isn't great but the activity levels were absolutely zero and you know he's got no energy to you know to play with his kids as you say like no no energy to like enjoy life basically so it's like right okay let's get the you know let, let's get the activity levels up here so like nutrition wise it's like there's been some small changes yeah. but it's not been like you know calories of you know is it pretty much stayed the same for you know for, for the first few months it's like right okay let's keep the calories the same okay let's be a bit more sensible on weekends and stuff like that so overall it's probably come down a little bit but it's like let's get the activity levels up and let's make sure we, you know we're not if, if the activity levels are going up and we're crashing the calories too much oh, man, we're going to yeah. crash and burn pretty quickly so it's like right let's keep the calories relatively high where they are let's bring bring up the activity levels let's use the calories to fuel those workouts all of a sudden you know stronger more robust he's building you know he's building a strength and, and conditioning base for you know for him to to be at home to be energized you know he's saying struggling you know could be bothered to walk up the stairs could be bothered to play with the kids now all of those things are happening because you know the activity levels are up and I, i'd much rather that you know um than saying right okay let's let's crash the calories down let's train once a week or twice a week yeah you know it's um it's a much nicer way to 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 go for me and then we you know eventually over time we will look at you know as needed as we need needed more, we yeah. can reduce the you know calories where need where needed but um yeah so i think yeah really really interesting stuff yeah so i think yeah it's just an important thing to say again to reinforce the the global approach to it right you're yeah. trying to push your performance you're trying to be mindful of your nutrition but then in terms of creating that deficit, like keeping the steps up around it is, is massive and vital to, to support your goals for whatever weight loss or, or, or weight gain it is. Yeah, I think that's you know, just, yeah, I think, you know, if we go to a little bit more detail on that, I think it is important to, like I say, not just count the calories you're doing in the, in the, in the gym, yeah. like, you, like you said. And that's a big, you know, 
um, it's a big thing that we that we do and any good coach will do now is like, you know, if you've got a client who's coming in once a week or twice a week, or however many times a week, you know, it could be four times a week, you're seeing that person for four yeah. hours potentially. Yeah. Okay, so we might have like, you know, we might be burning, you know, 300 calories a session, 400 calories a session as an example. And still, you know, that might only be a thousand calories a week in the gym. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're burning. So it is the overall picture and it doesn't have to be complex, but like you say, you know, monitoring people's step count, monitoring the stress, monitoring the, the sleep, and just yeah. being, you know, being mindful of, you know, all the, all the aspects and all the factors that, that come time. into play really. Bloody lovely. There you go. Bloody lovely. Yeah. Um, God, it's nice to be back. Nice to be back and talk in the shop. Um, I think we can round off there. It was a lovely, yeah, I lovely, think that's uh, two ends of the spectrum. A bit of uh, advice on uh, cardio health and fat loss and a bit of uh, how to peak your performance for uh, weekly and monthly slash quarterly uh, competitions. So, something for everyone. Something for everyone. Make on game Saturday. Who's, yeah. who's going to be a man of the match or person of the game? Who's who's gonna who's gonna stand out looking at who's the list? Who's gonna like lift more than we expect? Some good names in there. We're yeah. just looking at the board. If anyone's watching on you, well, or or listening, we're we're looking at the board now. We've got some big names. There's some very good people in there, yeah. Coming down for the Metcon Games on Saturday. For our listeners, if anyone's not competing but you just want to come down and watch, like, some fun stuff, come down, come down. We're gonna meet at nine o'clock. First event starting at half nine. It's just going to be really fun. Like, it's going to be a great day, like Strongman. Um, you know, I'm strong going to check names out there. I'm going to say, I've been doing his programming, so I'm a little bit biased. No one knows who he is. Liam Brooker, mm. the, uh, the husband of Nas Reed. Uh, yeah. no, he doesn't do any Metcons, but he's been training for the Strongman stuff for uh, a couple of months. He's um, dark horse. He's, he's, dark he's the horse dark horse because no one will know who he is, and he's pretty yeah. strong. Yeah. Uh, so he could put up a good deadlift. I've, he can log press well. I've seen him in he's the court. Fast. Man. He's working the court, hard. Man. Yeah, he's, um, he's shifting. To so no one will know who he is, and he'll come in and he'll yeah. put in a good shift. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I think you know, I think Matt Spencer will offer a very good value. Yeah, good all rounder, strong boy, decent engine. Um, you know, we've got I think Kyle, mate, Kyle, Kyle, and you know James Lynch. You've got some, you know, some engines there. I mean, Kyle will go. All day. Yeah, all day. We'll finish, you know, finish at two o'clock, and he'll he'll have a session afterwards. Like you know, there's uh, <laughs> probably James as well. Um, Naomi, Naomi's going really well. Naomi and Mel, you know, and Mel too, yeah. like going Cass. real well. God, it's women, exciting. Are, women are well represented. They the certainly are. are. They certainly are. And look forward to you got Ella in there as well. Obviously, really strong weightlifter. Maybe hasn't done too much of the strongman stuff. So I'm really interested to see how she transitions. She said she's gonna clean and jerk the mug. That's that'd be awesome to see. Uh, Martin Lissig style. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that'd be great to see. That'd be great to see. Yeah, man, it's so, going to be good fun. It's good to see what made of with the uh, competition. Yeah. I enjoy seeing how people get on with it. Yeah, so. exactly. It's always a good buzz. And uh, I'd say, yeah, if you're not competing, any of our members listening, like, just come down, you know, and um, get amongst them. Get amongst them. Get amongst them. Fantastic come guys. Come and collect your t shirt. There we go. Make on games t shirts. On the wall, look at that. Um, more stash coming soon as well, actually. So, uh, stay tuned for that. And, uh, yeah, we'll round off there. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and we'll catch you next time. Cheers, guys. Decent.